Uh, Simba's scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians 15. I'll read it and then he will come and preach to us. Uh, It appears on the screen. I'll give you a moment to find it in your Bible or on your device if you are following along there. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 11. These are words of the Apostle Paul to the Corinthian Christians. And here he reminds them of what the gospel is. Um, the essence and the very heart of the good news of the Christian gospel and why it should be believed. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 1, and Paul says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. We thank God for his word. Simba, please. Right, can I just um, hand that to you, please? This is a gift for you. you. Yeah, no worries. You and me can be mates. I love books too. <laughs> Thank you so much for reading that scripture. How about we pray together? Father, we thank you as we come together to uh, this passage that you help our hearts to be open and help us to enjoy what you're saying to the church this morning and what you said to the church in Corinth, where you're speaking to us as well this morning. So we play Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Jesus, that you revealed yourself through your word. In your name we pray. Amen. So friends, what I set out to do this morning is uh, perhaps take us through uh, these verses that um, Pastor Matt has beautifully read for us. Um, again, it's a privilege for me to, to preach at this church for the first time. Thank you for your hospitality and more so thank you that I can share with you the heart of what African Enterprise does preaching the gospel. And this is the kind of message that we share when we, when we are in the 12 African countries and whenever we have a, a gospel event or when we are on the ground in, in, in Africa, this is the kind of message that we preach. So I invite you to, to this passage. So from verse 1, we, we, we are seeing um, something really uh, interesting Because he says there, now, brothers, I want to remind you. Now, he's used that phrase, I think, a couple of times. So he's sort of addressing various issues. Even in in chapter 8, he says, now, um, chapter 8, verse 1, he says, now, about food sacrificed to idols. So he's he's kind of jumping between topics, he's addressing things. And then in chapter 15, he says, now... 
brothers and sisters. So between any uh, issue that, that, that he's addressing, he jumps to a very, very important topic. Um, now he comes to the crux, the really the heart of the issue, the heart of the, the Christian message. So he's going back and forth. If you look at chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, he's talking about division, uh, arguing, you know, this is a glorious boasting. People are divided. Who's the best speaker? Who's Apollos or Cephas? Um, who baptized you? Uh, and uh, there's all these issues that is, you know, the issues of the church. I guess he could come here and address issues of the church. He does the same to the church in Corinth, right? But when he comes to chapter 15, he leaves that aside. He leaves that aside because actually we are getting distracted with what we agree on and what we don't agree on. Now I want to tell you what's really important. Chapter 15, verse 1. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand. It's like, what's wrong with you people? I want to remind you. Have you forgotten already? So as I come here this morning, I'm not sharing what you don't know. And I, I know Pastor Matt is a fine preacher. He's gifted. I'm not talking about something you haven't heard. I hope so. It is something you know already. So it is the gospel which you have received and which you have taken your stand. Now, verse 2, by this gospel, you are saved. You see that in verse 2? By this gospel, you are saved. Now, now what, I, what I want to say as I start is look carefully at how he uses that passive verb. It's actually passive. It is something that is done to us in which you are saved. So we, 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 we don't do anything to, to be saved. You know, he says, in which you are saved. So we were dead in our sins and in our trespasses, dead in our grave of sin, in our own volition. We, we, we are sinful and lifeless, as it were, as a corpse in, in a mug. But God in his mercy, God in his grace, saved us and brought us back to, to life. By this gospel, you've been saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you've believed it in vain. There are all these powerful verbs that Paul is using. Again, belief is a big thing even in the gospel of John. You've got to believe the gospel in which you, you, you have been, you, in which you have taken your stand. So taking your stand actually means there's some, there's something you've got to do. But it's not actually work, it's just your active faith. You've got to believe. So, believing in Jesus Christ. For I received, what I received in verse 3, I passed on to you. Of first importance, that Christ died for our sins. Now, he's getting to the heart of the Christian message. What I received, I passed on to you. As of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. And again, the gospel message, uh, <laughs> it, it, it is something that sometimes can be unclear. And I have, you know, now living in Sydney, in the Sydney Diocese, uh, in the in the city of Sydney, the gospel can be unclear. You, like for us, looking for a church, uh, we're now part of Windsor Anglican Church. Looking for a church, it was hard. You know that? It's hard to look for a church. What I look for is Christ preached. Are the songs God-centered? Uh, are the people warm, hospitable, welcoming? Do they love Jesus? Does the pastor preach Jesus? Do they open the Bible? How is the liturgy? It was hard to, 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 to make that decision. But what is the gospel? Even as you, know, you hear the word gospel, 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 for me, it actually starts right at the beginning in the book of Genesis. You've got to start with a powerful God. God that's great, mighty, creator, ever-living, who is in charge, who is in control, 
And we hear, we turn on the telly, there's bombs, there's a floods, there's global warming, uh, that, you know, markets are crashing, there's, you know, high cost of living. It brings you to tears, the suffering that you, you, you see, and all the pictures are dreadful, the things that you, you know, all sorts of things. I can't, you know, I'm not trying to suggest to you what, what the telly um, is projecting for us, but it all points to sin. So we've got to believe to a God now who is in control, a God who created, a God who sustains, who is utterly holy, thoroughly holy, who is mentioned in Genesis chapter 1. From verse 1 to 31, you know how much, how many times God is mentioned in chapter 1, verse, chapter one, verse 2 to verse 31? God is actually mentioned 30 times. God's mentioned 30 times, and he created, and he sustains. And he blesses, and he speaks, and things come into existence, into being. And God just sustains the world. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. He sustains the world through his powerful word. And then you realize that, again in chapter 1 in Genesis, good, 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 when God creates everything, it's, it's good, it was good, it was good, then in verse 31 in Genesis chapter 1, it was very, very good, everything that God created was very good, but 10 to chapter 3, sin enters the world through one man, Adam, and if you're born after Adam, like me, you're born in sin, and now when I'm talking about sin, I'm not talking about the wrong things that we do, I'm talking about the impulsion, that disposition to do the wrong thing. We are born with it. We are born with the sting, the very thing that makes us do the wrong thing, that makes us do wrong choices, that makes us rebel against God. God's calling us to him and we rebel, we go that way. That is what is called sin. And therefore, every person who sins, we've chosen our destiny. We are on the highway to hell. We are. And God then brings a solution. He brings Jesus Christ. Okay, you know, I don't have a long time, but when we come to chapter 15, the preaching of Jesus is central. Jesus is the only one. God is sent to save the world. Christ died for our sins. Christ was buried for our sins. Verse 4, he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and according to the scriptures, in that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelfth, and after that in verse 6, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Now, that's a euphemism for death, when he's talking about some have fallen asleep. They've died. Now, how many people have had like a uh, you know, have been disillusioned together. 500 people. It's, 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 it's really hard to have 500 people disillusioned about one particular thing. So 500 brothers are, are still alive. And some, 500 of them, brothers, at, at the same time. Is, is it easy to deceive 500 people at the same time? I'm lifting my big toe. It's a no. <laughs> It is no. So these 500 people actually saw him physically. It was a physical resurrection. They saw the resurrected Jesus. They saw him. At the same time, most of whom are still living at that time, they appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And then last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. A very cryptic phrase. Very hard to understand. What, what Paul meant there, you know, people who translate the Greek, which I'm not a specialist in that, but that phrase is really hard to understand. Paul is using a dissing phrase, so his, his opponents are dissing him, like, you're abnormally born, you, actually they're saying, you are stillborn, you're a dead infant. That's, that's, that's how he's speaking really like in a very derogatory way, you, you are a dead infant. Yeah. And Paul says, okay, now the stillborn, God has risen to, to life. For I am the least of all the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I, I am what I am and his grace to me was not without effect. Not that dead infant has been brought back to life. 
No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believed. Paul is actually using what the enemy was doing to actually say, hang on, you see, this is me, but actually it's not me. Whether it was me or not, you know what? This grace was actually sufficient. I've now done more than all of them. And Paul wrote nearly half of the New Testament. He wrote 13 letters of the New Testament. He, and he labored. And during the day, you know, he's making tents, very smelly animal skins, building, building stuff and making materials and selling that. And he's not taking money from anyone. He's not taking an offering. He's refusing the blessing of churches, working hard. He's saying, I work harder. Now, there's a culture of uh, these itinerant uh, apostles who are with sparkling oratory. And they're comparing him, you know, Apollos speaks better than you, you don't have better grammar, you don't, you don't use the proper Greek, you, know, you don't have, he's saying oh, that doesn't matter whether they or me, but you know God's using me to build his church, whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believed, for you know when Jesus Christ went on the cross, he took our sins on the cross, he basically took your sins and my sins and he was crucified on the cross he took your sins and mine. You read 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. says that although he did not know sin, God made him sin so that we can be called the righteousness of God in him. When Christ went on the cross, there was that greatest exchange that happened that he took your sin and my sin and he was nailed on the cross for our sins. And I count my sins. I can't count them because even since I was a baby, I take all the things I've done, hundreds of thousands of infractions and horrible things that I've thought about, the things I've reflected on. If my thoughts were to be projected here, it would be a horror movie. But all that was imputed on Jesus Christ. Now take your sins. Are they more than Mine, it's not about competition, but it's just the idea of how horrible we are when we stand before God. Even Jonathan Edwards, he talked about a little spider web and a rock falling on that spider web. That's, that's what we are without the righteousness of God. We're just like a big rock falling on that spider web. That's, that's, that's what he was, he was using a very dark image of this is our destiny if we don't know God. But God took our sins and impaled them on Jesus Christ. So when Jesus is on the cross, he cries. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's using Psalm 22 verse 1. And he's crying on the cross. He's saying, why have you so forsaken me? God is judging sin on Jesus. And God turns away, of, obviously, and there's darkness all over the world, all over the earth from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock. There is darkness. What is causing the darkness? Is it a solar eclipse? Absolutely not. But there's a theological thing that's happening. God is judging sin in Jesus Christ. And Jesus dies and he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. For God judges our sin in Jesus Christ. And he was buried. And on the third day, God raises him from the dead. And then Romans 10, verse 9 and 10 says, If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with your heart you believe and you are justified. You are made right with God if you believe in him, if you believe in your heart. Brothers, most of the time it's, it's, uh, you know, it's something that's just more academic. Or just, I, I, want, I want to I understand how things work. But if you believe in your heart, obviously it has to be logical. But you've got to believe in your heart and you're justified. Then, then, then it also says, and you confess with your mouth, and you'll be saved. And verse 13 in Romans 10 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You will not be put to shame if you believe in Jesus Christ. Friends, everyone who hears this message must respond. Must respond. Uh, John 5, I'm, I'm sure, John 5, 24, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you've crossed over from death to life. When? Right now. Right now, if you believe in him, if you trust in him, right now, if you haven't, you've crossed over from death to life. 
That is the message. Why, why is that happening? Or simply, as I finish, God loves you so much. God loves you. That's why he sent Jesus to die for you. The pain, hours in the scourging, the spitting, this, you know, all, all the scorning, the horror, the shame, all the horrible things that they did. Why did he have to go through that? He loves you. He loves me. That is the message for Sydney, for ACT, for WA, for Hong Kong, for New Zealand. That's the message I preach, whether I'm flying, uh, whether I'm in the back streets in northern Victoria, uh, whether I'm in the jungles of Africa walking on foot, you know, holding my shoes because it's all wet and dark. The things that keep me going, it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is, and that is why I'm here to share in that journey of preaching the good news to the nations in, in Matthew 28. So God's called us to, to reach the nations. So I'm inviting you on this journey to come with us to Africa, to share. If you do that here, do that when, when you're at, at the footy, do that. Uh, I was a chaplain to motorcycle clubs. I was a chaplain in, in Bigger Cheese. I was a chaplain to uh, a prison. Uh, I was a rector in a parish. The same, please do that. But I invite you again to come with us to Africa. Prayerfully consider coming on a short term mission. We'd love you to come, be part of what we're doing. We can organize that. Pray for us. Pray for our teams on the ground. Pray for me. Uh, pray for the harvest in Africa. Pray for our teams. Prayerfully consider giving to the mission of African Enterprise. How about we play that clip as I, as I finish that, that will be great. Thank you. I strongly believe in the vision and mission of African Enterprise to evangelize the cities of Africa through word and deed in partnership with the local church. I love sharing the story of African Enterprise with Australian partners and supporters. At the heart of African Enterprise are African evangelists on fire for Jesus and his message of hope. Africa is the fastest growing continent, with over half the world's population growth expected between now and 2050. There is a critical need to reach this growing population with the good news of Jesus, giving people hope and a future. Christians who have a heart to see Africa transform for Jesus support African Enterprise, the largest interdenominational agency coordinating national mission through word and deed by partnering with local African churches. Through African Enterprise's stratified evangelism, which focuses on impacting every strata of society in the cities of Africa, national and political leaders are influenced, as well as reaching the poor and the marginalized. AE coordinates thousands of volunteers and churches to holistically evangelize people in their own language and culture. As African Enterprise, we are really excited about what God is doing as we see the African church being mobilized into evangelizing this continent with the good news. Like you know, we are a continent that is beaming with lots of young people. And so we would ask for your ongoing prayers as we seek to empower these young people so that they can reach out with the gospel to the communities in Africa. We are also excited as we see them both hearing the word and being discipled and also being empowered economically through what we are calling the community transformation groups. Now the Ministry of AE, which is about evangelizing the cities of Africa, through word and deed in partnership with the church. That's what we exist for. And of course, out of our evangelistic concern and gospel concerns, we have deep concerns for practical care, uh, uh, compassionate action, generous aid to marginalized people. Thanks to your belief in the Great Commission, we are seeing up to 50,000 people a year making commitments to Jesus and millions hearing the gospel. We're also giving people new hope through changing life pathways. These include apprenticeship programs, self-help groups, and new skills to change families' lives. 
And for more than two decades, AE has partnered with Moore College, training pastors in Africa in biblical evangelism and mission through the PTC course. This ongoing partnership continues to bear incredible fruit. African Enterprise has been engaging in this mission for over 50 years, thanks to the founding vision of Michael Cassidy and the work of many leaders, including Festo Kivangeri, Stephen Longo, and Stephen Maborgo. And the leadership in Africa continues to thrive with your love and support. And we are so appreciative of your regular gifts to sustain this ministry. We pray that your life will be transformed too, as we journey together to win many thousands for Jesus. There are many ways that you can get involved with AE. Join us on a mission, become a prayer partner, commit financially, spread the word, and come on board as ambassadors of this great mission agency, as followers of Jesus. Let's put our hands together and empower Africans to reach Africans with the gospel today.